What day is it, Panda? It's Gorian Day! And for Gorian Day, I read Gore by John Norman. And let me just tell you that as John Norman book, oh my god, why does it take him three freaking paragraphs to explain one simple thing? Why? Why? Why would you make me read this piece of poo? Oh my god, it's so overly detailed and a chore and... And I liked it. I, I, I liked it. You liked John Norman, <laughs> didn't you, Rocio? <sighs> well, we know what we gotta play now. You were right, Panda. I actually enjoyed this book. Um, that's but not that's none of my business. <laughs> the, it does have its issues in the beginning of the book. I almost thought I wasn't going to like it when I first picked it up because, let's say, John Norman is not exactly, he does not exactly ease you into Tara Cabot as a protagonist. was Titan's Men of Gore. And that was written by John Norman. I believe you know his real name. John Frederick Lange Jr. It was written in 1966? 1966, original publication. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the Gore books are up to 34 books. First of 34. What a wonderful and triumphant writing achievement that is, Mr. Norman. I mean, I have read his sex book, so let's not go there. And I'm not talking about Core. <laughs> so he's written more than 34 books. But 34 books for one series, that's that's a lot. I mean, the last one was written in 2016? 2016. 2016. That was uh, Plunderer. Or Plunder, Plunder of Gore. Plunder of Gore in August 2016. Oh, boy. Published by E-Reads. <laughs> I mean, I will read Earl 34 books and put them up, but there's got to be some kind of want for that. <laughs> and of course, in addition to the, well, technically 25 books, but 34 novels have been written. Uh, in addition to that, there was an attempt uh, twice to adapt some of the books into a movie format. You had the original and the, its, its first sequel, Outlaw of Gore, that got converted into a movie. And recently, the most recent development that I've heard of is uh, someone, uh, Postmortem Studios, actually released an officially branded role-playing game, finally. Uh, like a full-blown system and everything for, for uh, the Gore universe. So that was interesting. I wonder if they use that on the Second Life Gore systems. I don't know. <laughs> I know I, I briefly mentioned it during our panelists of Gore panel that we had at uh, ZenkaiCon a while ago. I don't even remember how long ago that was. I think it was last year Zenkai Con. It probably was. Pretty sure. They're all blurring together now. We've done so many. <laughs> this is all about a man named Taro Bristol. It, the first few chapters are about basically him growing up without parents and then going to college and then he goes on a faithful hiking trip in which he finds a blue envelope in the middle of the forest. He opens it, it's this um, rather short letter from his father saying, you know, you will have a choice to fulfill your destiny soon enough, bring me a piece of earth back. He goes a little bit crazy at one point, because I forget what it was. Oh, his father told him to discard the letter because it was going to be destroyed, and... He decides, oh, well, I'm going to go home in the middle of the night and throws it in his pack. And then his pack goes on fire and destroys everything he had. Because <laughs> unlike Inspector Gadget, 
<laughs> he forgets to throw things away. Apparently. And then and then he op- he has his compass in his hand, so he's like, okay, well, just use the compass to get me home. But the compass is going wild. So then he basically runs in this big, giant circle. And when he gets back to where he started, there's a spaceship waiting for him. I did mention that this this has kind of a slow start for me because that was just crazy. He picks up a pile of earth dirt, as he remembered was in his father's letter, and then gets in the ship. And then he wakes up on a on another planet, Gore. The Counter Earth. And they call it the Counter Earth because, if I remember this correctly, the Priest Kings can move the earth where they want it, and they have moved it to the to right behind the sun. That's why our astronomers cannot see it. And it's also, uh, the counter earth is smaller from what I remember. That's Slightly, like, like, yeah. So, like, the gravity's weirder, because I know that Tarl mentioned... Because a smaller planet <laughs> makes the gravity different. <laughs> thing on Gore are the priest kings, which are these mythical, we're not sure if human or are human beings that live, isn't it like on the top of one of the mountains? In the ranges? Sardar! Isn't it like on, on a mountain range? Yeah, the Sardar Mountains. Right. I think there's like two major mountain ranges on the planet, the Sardar, well off far in the east or some something, it's where the priest kings allegedly live. And, and if I remember correctly, the reason we don't know more about them is anyone who goes and attempts to go up there, like, never comes back to tell anyone what happened. Correct. So, I mean, it's basically a death sentence, we think. Um, or is it? I believe they mentioned that the priest kings are possibly immortal. Um, again, from... Uh, Earlier, they moved the planet, which I believe Tarl is like, how did they do that without killing everybody? But Because of the priest kings! They're the priest kings. Uh, they also have their own affliction. They call it the affliction. Uh, it's essentially leprosy, where it's like, if you go against what the priest kings do and they don't automatically just kill you with a flame death, you become sick and it's highly contagious. It's basically leprosy. Um, Very convenient. Blame it on the gods. And once once you have that, you have like two options of living. You can walk. You have to walk around with like this yellow hood. I think is how they walk around with a yellow hood. You can either like basically walk around the edges of any town, but you're not allowed to go in the town. Or they build these big like trenches. Oh right? yeah, the, the trenches, pits of the afflicted. The pits of the afflicted. <laughs> Where you can just live in this pit for the rest of your life and uh, make sure... Guaranteed to get fed. Guaranteed to get fed, but you can never leave that pit once you go in it. Period. Ever. You're done. That's it. Yep. So, uh, those are the priest kings. I don't have anything else to add. No. Because there's not really much else. Uh, I mean, according to the... We'll get to the cast in a second, but according to some people, if if you piss off the priest kings... They can invoke the flame death upon you. Just pillar of fire out of nowhere. Just burn! Burn! Um, no, there is one more thing. They are the ones who supposedly also bring life to Gore. Like, they bring people from other planets and just dump them on Gore. And if they deem it, you can just leave Gore, too. They, they can send you right out of Gore. So they, they have, like, three, three uh, acts of punishment. It's either banishment, flame death, or the affliction. Yeah. Um, so then we're going to talk about the city-states, right? Yeah. It's kind of like ancient Greece in that Yeah, respect. every single city basically gets set up its own way. And, I mean, they, they keeping it as concise as possible, basically, uh, for the most part, every city kind of is off on its own. Goring culture is very closed off and xenophobic. If you're from... They, they make special, special emphasis on the fact that the word for stranger and enemy are the same in the Gorian language. Mm-hmm. So basically, if you're off somewhere else and you're not rate age, I was going to say something else, <laughs> raiding or pillaging. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> then you might want to stay in your own territory because pro- there's a good, an equal chance that someone will kill you as much as trade with you, unless you're a merchant. Speaking of which, <laughs> the caste the system. The caste system. <laughs> Um, so there's the initiates, right? Yep, the initiates, who are the ones who can speak to the priest kings. They're technically at the top. Mm-hmm. And then... Really, the only other important... I mean, there's other ones in there, like merchants and builders and doctors. And then the only one that's really important is technically at the bottom of the of the high, high casts, casts are the warriors. Are the warriors. And the reason is because, well... Kind of like in feudal Japan, it's like, well, we can't not have the warriors be in the high caste, otherwise they're going to get uppity. And well, not only that, I just remembered something else about the priest kings. They control the technology on Gore. Yeah. So um, you're not allowed to like they do have inventors, but they're not allowed to invent something like they don't. There's against no against the gun, rules. Against the rules, and you're not allowed to have anything like guns. So all of their weapons are like like spears, swords, yeah, and bows and arrows. Stuff. And even then, they don't, from what I understand from older Toro, they don't really use bow and arrows as much. It's more like swords. Yeah. It's thing like more up, up close and personal warrior stuff. Right, right. The bows are a peasant weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you have the city of R, which is important in this particular yeah. story. At the time of the story's entry, uh, R is... Much like other cities, but because R is so great and powerful as it is, uh, kind of comparable to ancient Rome, uh, they're, they are using a special mechanism of Gorian culture in order to kind of dominate several other cities in, with it in close proximity to itself. Under a new ruler, which we're about to get to. Uh, because uh, you should probably talk about the way uh, the cities are governed themselves. The homestones? Well, the, just the government in general. Oh, isn't it? I know that there's the administrator in times of peace. Yeah, right? there's like so this there's big council with the high castes. Yeah, for, with the high castes, and then the administrator, and then I know that there's like the warriors and stuff like that. The only time the like, warriors matter in government. <laughs> um, and then in times of war, you have the ubar, uh, which basically governs. They take over the entire government. It's just the ubar gets to basically. Dictator. And the best thing about the Ubar is there's no term limits. It's until they deem the war is over. And again, special emphasis is given that, well, I mean, depending on the circumstances, you can it, just keep going. It basically just depends on whether or not your men want to throw you out. Yep, yep, there is that sense. If they decide they're no longer loyal to you, well, then you suffer the ultimate punishment of the Ubar taking too long in government, right? Yeah. And they impale him. And that's, this... That's the price. It's this very unique system that uh, creates the be- uh, the environment that... Uh, it's this yeah. particular system that uh, creates the environment that our story takes place. Other things about Gorian culture? The homestone. Or do I not go into Oh, no, please. Discuss homestones. Homestones. Um, they're essentially stones that uh, are placed in the center of a city. They are essentially the flag of that city. So it has special runes, like uh, Korba, which um, Matthew, Charles' father, is mm-hmm. a part of, is the administrator of. His has, like, a piece of dirt in the middle of the stone of Earth to show that he came from Earth. And the homestones basically act like capture the flag. It's very, you're not supposed to. (laughs) Was that not a good comparison, Panda? I've never heard anyone make that comparison before. It's the only thing I thought of when I heard about this point. It's like, you're not supposed to go steal the homestone. Because being (coughs) caught means certain death but if you manage to catch it and bring it all the way back to your city you are rewarded so let's totally capture the flag and it's the mechanism by which R, as we mentioned the greatest city on gore is managing to dominate several yeah it's like capture the flag it's it's totally they they have (laughs) (laughs) 
You don't even have to fight a war. If you have the homestone, they will basically do whatever you want for as long as you have it. Right. Um, and I believe R has not just their homestone, but like a whole bunch of other cities' homestones in this big, like... Yep. What, what do they call the it? The central cylinder. C- the central cylinder. I was like, I was going to call it a tower, but that's not what they call it in the book. So, um, and then of course the most notable part about this book that at least anyone who has least heard of Gore will know about slavery. Uh, slavery is kind of like you kind of have to submit into it, from what I remember. I mean, it kind of depends. It, um, Ostensibly, slavery affects whomever is a. It's a kind of circumstance of the of the frequent warfare frequent that goes war, on yeah. on Gore, uh, but of course, being a heavily patriarchal society, it's mostly women. And then just in the course of warfare, it's like, oh yeah, this is basically how we manage to keep inter inbreeding out because we are constantly raiding our neighbors. And what's the easiest thing to carry off that isn't a sack of gold? Oh, they're daughters. You make it sound horrible. But, um... Uh, <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that they don't have male slaves, it's just that you won't see a man uh, submit themselves into slavery. Mostly at least not because, warriors. Especially not warriors, because it's against their warrior code. They have to... They have to fight or be killed. You either die, you live and die by the sword. So, you you will most likely never see a warrior suddenly decide to submit themselves. To submit as a warrior is ultimate shame. You have no other fate but to be a pitiless slave. And I figure at that point they would probably just kill you out of just because. Oh, it, yeah, this be- this is uh, something that comes up again later in the, like in the uh, in the series. But yeah, we, that's that's the gist of it. <laughs> um, I mean, I know that the one rule is if you decide to submit yourself, which is basically get on your knees and hold your hands up like this, it's like the person you're submitting to can either accept your submission or they can kill you. So you're at their mercy at that point. <laughs> Now it's time to talk about some of the important characters in the book. Right. Well, we obviously have our main character, Tarl Cabot. Tarl Cabot. See, a giant redhead. I'm gonna butcher all these Gorian names just because I read the book, and when you have the name in your head, it sounds different than apparently the audiobook's gonna sound. So I go by the um, audiobook. Uh, for pronunciations, but honestly, like, if you look at it, uh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, Tarl becomes a timesman of Koroba. Koroba. Koroba! <laughs> you are not from Koroba. He's the one who they, they task him with. I should probably not go into the plot. He's our main character. He's going to be the main yeah. initiator of the plot. Blah, 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 blah. Um, the only thing I will say about him is he's kind of, it's not that he's not exciting. I, I enjoy what, reading up through his perspective. It's just, he can be he is an, an idiot. He is an earth man put onto a strange world and is trying to deal with this very different culture that obviously has different ideas about how to treat women. Oh, well, yeah, that comes up a lot. He definitely is like very... His confliction... It is a source of a plot point the entire time. It sometimes gets them into really dumb situations. Yeah. Um, that's not even what I'm talking about. Like, he's just an impatient man until the end where they're like, seriously, you need to learn some patience in war. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself killed. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's okay. He's not my favorite. I do have a favorite in this one. All right, well, we'll come to it. Yeah. So then we have his father, Matthew Cobb. Matthew- I was just going to start saying the names for you. Go ahead, say the name. His father. Matthew Cabot. <laughs> I fear if I say it, I'm just going to sound like cabbage. Matthew Cabbage. Cabbage. Yes, Archibald. <laughs> I would like some tea, please. 
Well, he doesn't come up too often in the book. He's the administrator of Koroba. Um, also a former U-Bar. Yep, a former Because he U-bar. was a good U-Bar and gave up power Not when it was necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he shows up again at the end of the book, which I won't explain how or why, but it, he, he pretty much comes in at the beginning and comes in at the end. Yeah. So, uh, then you have the assassin. Parkour! 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 Wait, what? Say that name again? Parkour! <laughs> what? <laughs> but I meant it, that's Parkour! Not what I meant. Parkour! Parkour! Parkour, the master assassin. I'm sorry, parkour, master of the cast of assassins. And to explain why I'm I'm surprised about the the saying of that is it spelled P A dash like parkour. C C U R. Yeah, it's it's a long A sound. It's parkour. Parkour. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's the he's the master. What? Master of the cast, cast of assassins. assassins. <laughs> or something like that. I don't remember. Then we have Tali... Ta- say it. Talina! Oh, Tali- Talina? Talina. Like Tylenol? Talina. Talina. Yes, like Tylenol. <laughs> Talina, who happens to be my favorite of all the characters. She is the daughter of the Ubar of... Glorious R. R. She has a really major part in the story, but she kind of just gets wrangled into it, and I just love her. I love uh, uh, she. She's a very badass woman. So that's, that's then there's Marlenis. Marlenis, which is her father, which he is the U-bar, U-bar. of U-bars. Oh yes, he is the U-bar. U-bar of, of U-bars. U-bars. They do mention that. And it's because he's head of R, which is dominating a bunch of other Those cities, cities. in a very unusual for Gore. So mm-hmm. he's very powerful. Right. Then we have Tarl's best friend. Well, he's not doesn't start out as his best friend. But he is his best friend. Kozlak. Yes. Of Port Car. Of Port what? Port Car. Port Car. That becomes important later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the um, Jewel of Gleaming Thassa. <laughs> Never mind. No one's going to get that. So, Kozlak of Port Car. Um, he, He's a merchant, isn't he? No, Kazrak of Port Carr is also a warrior. They meet on the oh, road, right. which we'll get to. Um, and then, finally, Mintar, the merchant. Mintar, the merchant. Who is... Just a merchant, a greedy old merchant, who tells us a lot about merchant law. Isn't he also Kazrak's boss or something? At the time, yeah. Yeah. on Gore, on the Kalnara, and he meets his father. This is where some of the Goring culture and stuff that I told you in Goring languages is basically taught to him. Yeah, he gets a little bit of a crash course and everything. And there's a few minor characters that help in his training. There's like the older Tarl, Tarl, who trains him in weapons, weapons. and uh, the scribe, who teaches him in languages. Uh, And then he has his big big trial to prove that he is a warrior by uh, taming a Tarn. Which is essentially a big giant eagle. And you, uh, basically, you're supposed to have this bond forever with this tarn. And you, uh, they're still semi wild, especially for the warriors, because they're supposed to be still, like, they're supposed to help you in battle because they have these big long claws and, like, they're carnivorous, so they will eat people and stuff like that. Uh, so you keep them under control with a tarn goat. Tarn goats! Which is basically like a... Bzz, bzz. It's like that thing from Jurassic Park 2. Yeah, that. After he proves himself, his father sends him on a very important mission. Because ours get a little too big for its britches, and it's important that they stop them. But the only way they're going to stop them is if they can get the homestone of R. They have this plan, which Tarl does not a- kind of agree with, because... He has morals. So uh, this slave girl that he was going to have basically be a slaughtered lamb, he just like leaves her in the middle and goes, you are free now. Then he goes and he screws everything up. 
<laughs> the daughter, Talena, this is where we meet her, catches him in the act of trying to steal the homestone, and he is flustered because he can't find it. They get into a big fight. She manages to end up on his tarn with him and the homestone, and she manages to kick him off. He wakes up in a giant spider's web. Just and, like in The Hobbit. And the spider turns out to be friendly. So he lets him go. And he's like, I will let you, I will guide you through the swamp. So. <laughs> what? Did I miss The it? reason that he can understand the spider is because of a translator, translator box. I'm sorry. Because of a translator <laughs> box. <laughs> Okay, so it's because of a translator box. So, uh, and he's also friendly because R is kind of like, we are going to use you for our necessities. And they're like slaves and they don't care about... The... What? It's a plot point! Yeah, yeah. The, the spider's like, they don't care about us. We're rational creatures. We don't kill them for just because. And they kill us just because. So... Because everyone in R has arachnophobia. I would be scared of that, to death of them. He leads them through the swamp, and on their way through the swamp, they meet up with Tylena again. Tylena! Tylena, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forget what she was fighting. She was fighting something. Not important. There was this big thing, and, he, and Tarl saves her from this giant monster thing. And basically threatens to leave her there. But she's kind of high and uppity, you can imagine, oh my god, what is the woman's name from Ants? The princess from Ants. The princess from Ants. Yeah, the, that's exactly, she has this high and uppity, like, you, you shall take me back to R, because I said so. You stole it, you know. Uh, you stole the homestone, so how dare you? And he goes, well, where is it? Because I don't see it on you, and it's not <laughs> on me. And she goes, oh. Yeah, the tarn left with the homestone and just <laughs> ran off in the wild. And Tar Tar was like, "Oh, well, I guess that means my tarn is wild now, and I'm never getting him back." Okay, I have failed. I will go back to Korba as a failure, I suppose. So she submits <laughs> he to doesn't him. Doesn't even care. <laughs> no, he doesn't care. He goes, "I did what I had to do." Uh, there's a, there's a war going on in R for, you know, this missing homestone. I don't care. Just take me back to Korva. As soon as they get out of the swamp area, there are two soldiers from R. And Talena is like, oh yes, I am safe. Take me home now. I am the daughter. And they're like, oh, you are? Cool. Take off your clothes. You are a slave. We are going to kill you. Welcome to Gore! <laughs> Welcome to Gore! It's like, the, the reason is, is Marlenis is being hunted too, because since the homestone was lost under the Ubar of Ubars... Remember that unique <laughs> system, ladies and gentlemen? Oh yeah, you can be Ubar as long as you have support. So Guess now, what's not going to get you any support? <laughs> losing, losing the, the homestone! homestone. Uh, so they're going to kill him and his entire family, which means her. Uh, she actually ends up killing one guard, and Tarl kills the other one by accident, because he's, he's, like, so anti-killing by this point. He doesn't want to kill anyone, and he's a warrior. He kind of has to. So she basically decides to disguise herself as a slave, and she does submit to, like, she submits to him, like, three or four times, and tries to kill him, like, a few times during her yeah. submission. So, she spends a lot of time <laughs> deciding been... that, oh, no, you know what, screw that. Screw that, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna submit it, I'm just gonna kill you, because basically she submits to him in this part, and then grabs the dagger from the one dead guy, and immediately tries to stab him in the back, and he goes, you just submitted to me, really? <laughs> so they end up walking... Sounds like you need a spanking. <laughs> so they end up walking the Korba, and she's in full slave... Guard, which they also have like slave hoods I think is the the only concealing part of the costume is the gun. No, it's basically to keep them from running away yeah and um along the road this is where they meet the merchant oh no the warrior who's, both yeah yeah I want you to say the name because I'm gonna butcher it Kazrak of Kaz Port Car they have this conversation and Tarl 
decides to tell him he is Tarl of Restol. Not Tarl of Korriba. Because Tarl just likes to be a confusing jerk-off sometimes. He does. Oh, I mean, I could say... Oh, okay. Oh, well, yeah, he gives the reasons. Well, I am I mean, I don't know if if I'm in an area where people will like the fact I'm from Korriba. I'll just use a city no one's heard of. Right. Tarl of Bristol, which is his home city at this point from Earth. And I believe he's counting on the bluster of men to basically not admit that they never heard of the city. So they just don't well, ask of him. Of course I've heard of Bristol. Well, of course I've heard of Bristol. Ha, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's like, oh, I fancy your slave. Can I have her? He goes, no, she's not for sale. Go, okay, well, I challenge you then. And since a warrior can't not accept the challenge of another warrior... They have to fight to the death. Except Toro's very anti-death. So he just stabs him through the shoulder and the other guy's like, okay, I've lost. <laughs> and that's, that's more or less how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and now they are sword brothers because the merchant comes and goes, Mintar. Mintar. The merchant comes and says, well, now that I'm out one warrior, you owe me a job. Sell me your slave. She's not for sale. And they, they bicker over the price for a little bit, and he's he kind of gets the whiff, like, is she a daughter of an Ubar or something since you won't sell her? No, she is the daughter of a goat hoarder. <laughs> and Talena yeah, takes, great about <laughs> Talena takes great <coughs> offense to this, and she goes, I am not the daughter of a terrible goat hoarder. Well, she's not a very well-behaved slave. Hush now. <laughs> she, I, I love, I just... This is one of the reasons why I love her. She will not t- submit to being a good slave, even if she's just acting as one. Yeah. So to make up for the fact that he's injured Kazrak, who's one of the guards of Mintar's caravan, uh, Tarl substitutes in uh, to save Kazrak from, you know, debt, etc. So that's why they become sword brothers. It's a few chapters of them just basically wandering around. They fight. They get money. Uh, and then... Um, Tara finally comes up with this, like, ha- like half-assed plan. I'm, it's half-assed. He's like, I'm either going to buy another Tarn, or I'm just going to steal one from the Tarn's men. Uh, once they, well, once we one get of those to, two! <laughs> once we get to the city of tents, I believe, where all these merchants gather around, and then Tara gets hit in the face. And knocked out. And when he wakes up, it was the assassins who have finally found him. the assassins all along. <laughs> and they basically say, well, you know, we're going to be the ones. It's Parkour, I believe, who's talking to him. Parkour! Yeah. Well, there's been, there's been a lot of developments uh, while he's been wandering off in the woods. Because, I mean, you get a, br- you get a brief hint of it because uh, the men of Ard don't need Talana back. And what's happened is, in the in the chaos ensuing from the removal of the homes, homestone, there happens to be an, a character who was earlier hinted at finally gets introduced for real. And that's, of course, Pakor, Pakor. Master of Assassins. Right. He's the one who actually tried to assassinate Tarl earlier in the story while he was gro- learning things in Koroba. And now, Parkour is going to take a much bigger role uh, in the wake of the downfall of, of R. Yeah, I believe he said he want, basically wants to rule it as it as its king. Yeah, what's happened is that a bunch of the cities that were under R's foot are now banding together to go attack R, and Parkour is being appointed the head of that army. Right. Unusual because assassins aren't high cast. Mm-hmm. And Parkour wants to tie up some loose ends. Well, he what happens is he. Uh, he says that Talena basically told him, okay, I will serve as your queen, I will submit to you. And has specifically stated, I don't want you to kill him and give him a decent warrior's death. I want you to humiliate him. So they put him on the frame of humiliation, which is essentially like, how do I explain it? It's like this... Giant wicker frame. Yeah, it's this wicker frame. It's meant to float in the water and you're like tied hands by your wrist and by your ankles on it. And they just let you float on the river until you die. Yeah, and if exposure doesn't kill you, one of the various water carnivorous creatures will probably get you. Or a time will come and get you, which is... Put out your eyes! (laughs) Uh, I believe he spends like two or three days on there 
before a torrent actually does pick him up, the frame of humiliation breaks off, so he kind of has free range of his arms and legs again, but he can't get out of the claws of the torrent. And then another torrent comes and attacks that one, and manages to grab up Tarl, and then take him up to this really high ledge. There is where he finds out it was his own Tarn. My U-Bar of the skies! And that's where he finds his pack in the homestone. And he's like, I'm gonna sit down for some food. And hope that my Tarn comes back with food of his own, otherwise he's gonna eat me. <laughs> and that'll be the end of my story. After recuperating for a bit, our hero flies forth, seeking new fortunes and trying to recover... That traitorous girl, Talana. No, it says here he went, but he was going to go back home to Korma. That's what it says in my notes. I mean, he was. <laughs> he was, um, until he saw somebody who was afflicted being, uh, attacked by other carnivorous... There's a lot of random carnivorous creatures on Gore. And anyways, Tarl, because he's Tarl, it makes no sense, does actually eventually grab his hand. And then he's unarmed on the ground, and it's Marlenis, faking as an afflicted person. Hiding out with the diseased. Right. So, he manages to take Tarl as his prisoner. And like tortures him for like nine days or something like that. And then finally... Keep in mind, this is after <laughs> he's already been tortured for two or three days. Yeah, he's, this man's been tortured a lot. Um, and then he, after all those days of torture, he's like, okay, now you're going to die. And I forget what they were going to do. Like, impalement. Um, initially, they want to do impalement. Impalement, right. But... He puts up a fight, and he goes, Oh, well now you shall die a warrior, and now we're going to give you a torn death, because you war you want to die as a warrior. And... To explain how this works, what they basically do is it's like the rack, except... With the Instead of manual power, they're going to attach half of your... Half of you to one, one tarn, tarn, and the other half to another one, and then they're going to whip them until they pull, pull you, you apart. apart. Um, but here's an important plot point. He goes, are you sure you want, are you ready to die? And he's like, why do you keep asking me if I'm ready to die? Like, what is the point of you continually asking me that? And he goes, because I heard that Talena only submitted so that you might have a chance to live. And he goes, this gives him like the will to live again. Cause he was like, oh, I'm ready to die now. And he goes, oh, well, Talena wants me back. She, she loves me. What? Okay. Why I didn't the will someone tell me the sooner? <laughs> Why didn't someone tell me the sooner? So he he does manage to escape the time death, which they're like the time death is an unescapable death. So okay. except what it is, it is. Uh, and he grabs the uh, the uniform and stuff from that guy, and then flies off on the tarn to go back to R to try to find Tylena. The first person he goes to see in R is of course. The sword brother. Kazrak. There we go. See, Tarl sneaks into um, R, because this is the part where I got a little bored because I can't stand reading war, like uber delicate war stuff. He's like searching for a way in. And with the disguise he picked up, he like sets his, he sees that the, the back part isn't like guarded. Yeah. It's the only important part I remember. The back part of the city isn't guarded. So he goes back there, drops his tarn off at some, like, tarn nursery. <laughs> and... Tarn <laughs> nursery. That's what I would call it. It's All just right. a bunch of tarns together, and they get fed. And he's, like, uh, rubs the elbow of the guy a little bit with some extra money so that he would have the tarn at a moment's notice. And sneaks into... Kazarak's tent. And he goes, of course a warrior, if anyone sneaked into the tent, is going to kill me first. So I'm going to leave my ring on the floor so he knows it's me. And not kill me as soon as he walks in. And I'm like, okay. But, so he does that. 
and they're like, yes, we found you. Oh, I'm so happy you're not dead. And, of course, who walks in but the old Ubar, the Ubar of Ubars. I can't. Marlenis of Glorious R. Marlenis walks in and is like, no, I'm sorry. It's the merchant. The merchant walks in. Mintar. Plus, Mintar walks in and says, Marlenis wants to see you. Yeah. And they're like, they go over to the their tent and it's like, how did you know I was going to be here? And he goes, well, if you came back to R, which we knew you would, who's the first person you're going to see while here? And then they start <laughs> plotting together to finally fix something. Because you got R there and you got the outside army headed by Parkour. So, like, you don't really... Where are you going to go, Tarl? But now Marlenis is back, and Marlenis doesn't really know what to do. Because it's like, well, R wants to kill me, Parkour wants to kill me, what do I do? Yeah, the, the, there is a very long discussion about war strategies. They, they both put their own strategies, like, they settle on something, I forget what it was. And then Kazarak is like, okay, you need to have patience in order to get to uh Tylena. and it's like weeks and weeks of like just sitting around talking about what they might and might not do and then finally Tarl's like I have a crazy idea and Kazarak's like just just tell me what it is he goes I want you to take my ring go back to Koroba and get all the free people together all the free states all the free city states together because we need to get up against Parkour because he's going to be a dictator. So he goes along and then Tarl's like, wait, I might have sent him to his death. <laughs> Thanks for thinking about that once he's gone. Um, finally, one of his plans is to get his disguise together and go just basically say, I need to speak to Tylena straight away. And when he gets all the way up there and there's the woman in the, um, you know, in the... Ubar's, you need to remind me what that is. The robes of concealment? Yeah. He he waits until he hears her talk and it's not Talena. So now he's even more confused. Marlenis goes and fights for his people with his tarns and he flies over to where the execution is happening. And at that point, I believe he challenges parkour straight to, a duel. to a duel to the death. But before he can fight parkour, the high... He gets confused. Fronted by the high initiate himself of R, who is said by some to be the initiate of all initiates because he's from R. And so the initiate's like, she must die. The priest kings have commanded that she must die. Are you going to go against what the priest kings have decreed? And Taro is like, I love her. So yes, I will. I will go against the priest kings and I will make sure she I is would not... Do anything <laughs> for love. So, then the high initiate is like, well then you shall die a flame death. And then everyone waits. And even Tarl's like, okay. I, I, I... And then he goes, no, really, you should die a flame death. Nothing. And then this it's is... It's like he's actually shocked. <laughs> He, the high initiate goes into like a frenzy, like, no, really, he should be dying right now. Where is the flame death? And so. And then irony. <laughs> and then he. Explodes in flames. The flames. <laughs> so then he's the one who gets a flame death. <coughs> so, mostly because he in in the frenzy he went to go kill Carl, the uh, Tarl himself. And so then he dies of flame death before he can kill Tarl. So Tarl takes this as, well... I'm blessed by the priest kings! I am now going to uh, take Parkour into a duel for her life. And it's a wrecking duel. It is a long duel, is what it is. It's a very well, long Parkour duel. Well, Parkour is reputed to be the greatest swordsman on Gore. And so... In their fighting, they don't notice that there are more Tarns and that actually Parkour's men are losing the fight. Um, and it does, it takes Kazarak and Matthew Kavat to come down there and go, hey. We're winning. We're winning. 
And at this point, Parkour is like, I cannot win against these odds. I am going to die. So instead of dying by your hand, I am just going to throw myself off this cliff. And he does. Kill denial. <laughs> so at this point, now that they're like, oh, well, we're winning, Tarl turns around to Tarlena and is like, I want you to be my free companion in life. Okay, we didn't really talk about it because it wasn't that important. But right. a free companion is basically their equivalent of getting married. married. Because everything on Gore needs its own terminology. <laughs> so... And that's how we end up with the happy ending. And that is until Katarl gets sent back to Earth. Yeah, I was going to say, there's the epilogue where he's like, Okay, well, I, I had my wedding, and everything was great, and then I woke up on Earth. Oops. So, I mean, that's basically... And that sets up the major conflict of the next novel. I didn't know that part. I mean, it's not like it's a spoiler. That's literally the, the premise of the next novel. I mean, I guess I could have assumed that because he was like, I'm, I still go back to that place where that spaceship took me because I am awaiting the priest kings to bring me back. reaction to the novel um i mean it's i love this book all right go ahead no i do love this book it's just um there are parts where john norman turns back into john norman and over detailed uh over detailed certain parts where i just couldn't he really up. likes world building uh, no and and it's fine i really love some of the world building stuff i really love when he was talking about the goring culture and stuff like that um it's just, I'm more, I was more, like, bored out of my mind when he was talking strategies and fighting and war. I just can't wrap my head around that kind of stuff. Well, I can't agree with that, because I actually enjoy Kaisa, the game. Okay. It's like Gorian's version of chess. They mention it in the book. Um, and I, I really, really like Talena. Talena has to be, like, one of my favorite ones. Like I said, before, she does manage to, uh, even after she submits, uh, and managed to try to kill Tarl several times. Um, even, like, in the way she talks to him is very defiant and stuff like that. So, I would definitely read more of this book. It's really interesting, too, considering the central critique of, uh, of the gore universe as a series is its female uh, characters it's it is a, it's kind of weird to take that uh, at the back of your mind and then to go into the first novel and you find at least what Roxy feels as a strong independent woman character I think so and I and you know it may be an unpopular opinion but the, the slavery thing doesn't bother me mostly because one I know it was written in 1966 and so you kind of have to read it as a timepiece of an era and three, like, suspension of disbelief. It's it's just a fictional world, you know? It's just part of the world building. So. Yeah, and I mean, in a pseudo... I mean, if nothing else, in a pseudo-medieval wor world on an alternative planet, I mean, yeah, slavery existed, guys. I don't know if you ever picked up a history book, but, yeah, it keeps existing in this Greco-Roman world of gore. Which, by the way, our central protagonist keeps having a philosophical problem with. At the end of the day, a medieval Greco-Roman world is going to have slavery, guys. Congratulations. Well, I mean, it almost feels like it, it, when you read Norman, he really sucks you into the fictional world anyways. Well, he so, would like to. I, I, that's how I felt. Like, I actually found myself, like, really into all the, like, the way he builds the world... Slavery, the slavery aspect almost seems like an afterthought for me. Oh, in the first book it is. Yeah. I'm sure it's just in the first book. I'm only talking about the first book. I know. <laughs> Believe me. I know. I mean, if you have some really against prejudice against it, I just don't read it then, but... I, I mean, I have to... I'm the first one to admit I didn't read it because I knew it had female slavery, and then... I still ended up liking it at the end, so. Gore's a great book, guys. I actually do like it. 
Some of the thematic elements in the book uh, can be traced to some earlier works. I mean, I don't know if anyone out there reads the John Carter series, The Princess of Mars, but you have a lot of that built, um, that same idea in how the book is set up because uh, Charles Cabot is coming from Earth. They make a point to reference uh, different gravity, among other mm -hmm. things, and it's implied that his full life into adulthood being raised on Earth affects his abilities on Gore. It's one of the reasons why ultimately he's able to triumph over Pakor is he has an innate better strength in addition to everything else that he has as an advantage being the son of a U-Bar himself. Mm -hmm. Besides the slavery thing, um, any interesting thematic notes that you want to make a comment on? I mean, what I... The, the part that I found interesting was more, like, even though Tarl is, can sometimes be a complete and utter idiot in certain of his choices, um, I still enjoyed his character. Like, it was this man who's like, okay, I'm in this foreign world with all these really weird customs and languages, and, uh, like, I want to know more about it. But at the same time, I want to stay true to who I am and what my morals are. You know, being like, I'm really against the slavery thing. I'm really against killing people. So I kind of liked how that kind of sort of clashed, where he was like, how do I stay true to the warrior code, but also stay true to me? I thought that was a really interesting dynamic and balance the entire time. Tarnsman of Gore, how being a fuddy-duddy can almost get you killed. <laughs> Several times over, mind you. Yeah, you gotta love the part where it's like, oh yeah, these guys are gonna execute me. Okay. Okay. I can escape. These guys are gonna, gonna execute, execute me. me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Run to the gore. Oh, he's gonna <laughs> execute me. Ha <laughs> ha! Burn! And there's a lot of, you know, they say Lord of the Rings, there's a lot of aimless wandering. There's a lot of aimless wandering in this, too. It's like, well, now that I've stolen the homestone, I'm just gonna wander. Any other closing thoughts? Give, I think people should at least give it a try. The first one, at least. I'm interested in reading the rest Time of Time to start a whole series! Oh my god. I, I am interested in reading the rest of the series, and I might read it for my own enjoyment anyways. So, I mean, if people actually want me to review the rest of them, I will. We're going to turn it into an Iron Man contest. See how many volumes you can get her to read. <laughs> Before she can't do it anymore! <laughs> yeah, well, we could do that. I don't mind that. Like, if that's what you want, to see how long I can keep reading these without bashing my head in. <laughs> I don't know. Ten likes. Don't look at me! I like this series! <laughs> I mean, I like the first one. I just don't... You seem to think I'm just gonna, like, die. No, man! Well, next on the docket is Outlaw of Gore, and then Priest Kings of Gore. Do I actually get to know about the Priest Kings? You get to learn about the Priest Kings! Oh, yeah, I actually want to learn about the Priest Kings. Yeah, totally. Let's do it. Okay. I'll do it. So for Gorian Day, we thank you for joining us this evening. You can make every March 26th Gorian. Every March 26th is Gorian Day. <laughs> From now on, it's just Gorian Day. And we at the Manly Battleships bid you a very fun good night. Bye! Right? Is that how you do it? Right? Yes. <laughs>